on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I felt myself getting so frustrated listening to my fellow sportsmen blame their culinary shortcomings on the animals. If you go to a farm and you get a cow, you know, you're talking about a very young animal. And then we go into the wild and we come back with animals that are five, six, seven as an animal ages. You know, they lay down more and more connective tissue. The finest restaurants in the world dry age their beef for 28 days. And those are animals that haven't even broken into a trot, no less climb up and down 10,000 foot mountains. If we gut out a refrigerator, keep it at that ideal temperature, we can use that like a meat cooler. There's a lot of time, hard work, energy, money involved in our endeavors to fill our freezers. And with a little bit more effort, it's very rewarding. You can have a really great experience and a really bad experience off the same animal, depending on how (laughs) you cook it. On my tombstone, they're going to say John McGannon, the dry age guy. Episode 112 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Dry Age Guy with John McGannon, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Hey, just a quick heads up, we're taking next week, the week of December 20th, off from podcasting. Our team's going to enjoy the holiday, but we'll be back with a new show for you the week of the 27th. We're grateful for so much this year, but in particular for your incredible support. Happy holidays. And as I was saying, this episode is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's just released a brand new energy drink mix called Biomatrix. It's a natural, water-soluble, powdered energy drink mix based on an energizing concentrate of yerba mate. With a refreshing iced tea-like flavor and bright citrus notes, it gives you a nice lift without the jitters of many pre-workout formulas. And it supports your natural energy levels with a custom blend of amino acids and adaptogenic herbs like schizandra, goji berry, and rhodiola. If you're looking for a natural energy boost that won't leave you feeling wired, spun out, or depleted, check out Biomatrix at SirThrival.com. While you're there, take a look at the entire product line. As we head into winter, now's a great time to pick up a bottle of Sir Thrival's Daylight Concentrate, a vitamin D3 supplement like no other. Learn more at SirThrival.com where the coupon code WILDFED always gets you 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive? when you can thrive. Wild Feds just released a new hoodie and they're awesome. An earthy green and charcoal raglan style hooded sweatshirt with our horizontal Wild Fed logo on the front and our foraging basket, suppressed rifle and fishing rod circular logo on the back. These are really nice hoodies and I'm proud of the way they came out. Right now we're running a 15% off site-wide sale at Wild Fed. Everything in the Wild Fed store is 15% off with the coupon code DECEMBER. Go check out our new hoodie at wild-fed.com. I think you're going to love them. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's guest is John McGannon, chef, author, television host, a true pioneer in wild game cookery, and a veteran of the wild game cooking TV space that myself and my team at Wild Fed are still fledgling to. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to someone like him since he's already tread much of the landscape I'm now exploring, and also because he can give valuable context to what the last couple of decades in the space has been like. But probably most valuable is hearing his key takeaways about game cookery. After many years of trial and error, he's distilled down a few key strategies for making every cut of game shine in the kitchen and on the plate. Most significant, John says they'll probably put it on his epitaph, is his emphasis on dry aging. So if you're looking for takeaways from this episode, listen to how he suggests you age game meats at home. You'll want to work these ideas into your field care and kitchen. John McGann, and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me. Man, I was on an airplane flying home from a hunting trip, and I had uh, picked up the most recent issue of Carnivore magazine, which I think is a fantastic kind of new publication in the hunting space. And there was this big feature article on you. I really enjoyed that, man. So thank you for your contribution to uh, to that magazine. It helped turn me on to your work. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was fun. It was uh, actually it. Um, I was I was interviewed back in. I believe June, late June, and uh, I was uh, I was out at Reno, 
um, getting ready before I went and, and did this marathon of a, a event that I've done for the last 26 years. And my girlfriend and I are up at the Peppermill Hotel, and uh, I had to I had to excuse myself from the pool. Uh, because I had an appointment with John Schwartz from Carnivore Magazine, and I had to go back up to the room for a two-hour interview for that. <laughs> so, that was, <laughs> so, you know, it's sometimes you you got to do what you got to do, right? Sometimes you got to rob the pool goers from the view. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, there was a lot that you talked about in there that I I hadn't really seen, heard, or read put in quite the way that you described it. Um, so I want to get into some of that stuff. But first, you've just got this incredible pedigree in the um, hunting, fishing, cooking space. And I thought maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. I'm looking here at kind of your resume and it's like, man, it's overwhelming all the stuff you've been a part of. I'm I'm really new in the space with our show Wild Fed on the area. We're filming our second season now. So, but you've been in the space a long time. Tell people about that. Yeah, um, well, I, it's it's kind of funny. You go back. I'll go back to your traveling on a on an airplane trip um, back in 1995. Uh, I was coming back from a consultation trip that I did over in Hong Kong. I opened up a, a restaurant over there for, for a client of mine, and it was right at the beginning of um, of the birth of cable TV. Um, and I noticed a lot of my fellow chefs had their own little niche. Uh, you know, you had the Wolfgang Pucks from L.A. and you had Namario Batali from New York. And, and I thought, I said, you know, nobody is doing anything for people who hunt and fish. And so I'm, I'm a, at this point, I was up in the Bay Area outside of San Francisco. And there was a gentleman by the name of Charlie West, and he had a – uh, a fledgling uh, cable TV show going on, and it was called Charlie West Outdoor Gazette. And so uh, I'm I'm on a 15 hour plane ride, and this was before we had laptops and iPads and all that stuff. So I'm I'm writing out this idea that I have with a proposal, and you know a couple of couple of you know scenarios for uh, for a TV show. And I, I mail it off to him. So, oh, about two weeks later, I get a random call. And it's, um, yeah, John McGann. And hi, this is Charlie West. He says, um, I, I, got your, uh, I got your proposal and your ideas. And you're really never going to believe this. But about a week before receiving your documents, I had signed a contract with the Outdoor Life Network to do a series of outdoor cooking TV shows. And I yeah. had absolutely no idea how I was going to pull that off. Wow. And uh, so, short story, um, about three weeks later, I found myself up uh, in the San Juan Islands off of Puget Sound uh, in Washington. And we were um, filming 17 TV shows on the what used to be called the Outdoor Life Network. And uh, that was... That was in, oh, by that time, it was almost 1996. And um, yeah, I was uh, one of the original outdoor cooking TV chefs, I suppose. <laughs> what were the, so tell us about some of the shows you've worked on. And, and I, there's this thing, actually, I just got to ask you about. As I look over this resume, I saw this, see if I can find it here. Something about the Bohemian Grove Valley of the Moon. <laughs> And I just got, yeah, I got to just ask about that because there's so much, uh, you know, well, if I, if, I tell you, if, about, yeah, if, exactly. if, if I tell you, then, you know, this, I don't know if this is ever going to make it on the air. I'm gonna um, have to no, it there. is a, uh, <laughs> I, I have been, um, it's actually funny because I was introduced to the Bohemian Grove through the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, or actually my affiliations. When I, I moved up from Los Angeles to the Bay Area in uh, 1991, and I was I was running a restaurant in downtown San Francisco, but I had always been involved in in um, wildlife conservation groups. I, I was I've been a member, a life member of the Elk Foundation since 1987, and um, anyway, I got to the Bay Area and I looked up the local chapter, and um, you know signed up as a volunteer. And uh, one of the gentlemen who um, uh, was was in, was running this this uh, committee, um, after about a couple of years of doing our fundraising banquets and dinners, and 
I donated a couple of um, wild game cooking outings and whatnot. He um, he introduced me up to the uh, to the Bohemian Grove, and that was uh, <laughs> that was in 1996. So uh, I've been going back up there for oh one week in June, three weeks in July every year since. And uh, I've taken care of, uh, uh, it's a, it's probably one of the most exclusive private men's club in the, uh, in the country, if not the world. That's what I always hear. I imagine that's all you'll tell me, but uh, <laughs> very, very interesting stuff. But uh, tell me about some, you said the Outdoor Life Network. Who are they now? You said formerly known. Oh, they, them. yeah, they've, I mean, once it went, once everything went digital, yeah, they, it's funny. I have a couple. Of, I was downstairs in my garage and going through some old boxes and whatnot, and found all the VHS tapes. <laughs> and um, yeah, that I'm 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 trying to find a VHS player. So, uh, <laughs> which you know, it's a it's it's a, it's a dinosaur, that's for sure. But um, yeah, I don't think I I'm, I mean I'm sure they're either bought up by the Sportsman's or the Outdoor Life right. Network, and um, which are all owned by the, the same company. Um, yeah. and I've, I've also, I, I see that you have, you know, your show is on there and, um, I, I'm also a guest chef with, uh, my good buddy, Scott Layseth on the, uh, the sporting chef. And I've been doing, doing guest appearances on his show for the last, oh, 10 years or so. Okay. So, uh, we, it's come a long way. I actually did a podcast with Scott, oh, a couple months ago. And the uh, the title of it was called Grumpy Old Chefs. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. I was like, oh, I really love it because we had Scott on a few months ago, and it was cool for me to talk to him because you know, being new to the network, it's cool to get a little bit of perspective on um, how things have uh, evolved over the years. And so that's something I'm kind of curious about too. Is just like what kind of changes you've seen in the Publix or even in the hunting spaces interest from uh, in the food component. Um, my impression from Outdoor Channel was that they're you know they're pushing more and more for food content now, and that maybe the that in the past the interest was more in the hunting fishing component. And so curious if that seems sounds true to you, or or do I kind of have a skewed perspective on it? Yeah, no, most definitely. I mean, in in today's world, the the evolution of cuisine and food. Um, it's funny back. I, I origin, I'm originally from New York and, uh, graduated the culinary Institute in Hyde park a long time ago. Um, have been very fortunate to work with some of the leading culinary figures, uh, across the country. Um, and, and back in the day, people always say, you know, the, one of the, one, one of the common questions that you get when you tell somebody you're a chef or you're in the food service industry is, oh, well, what's your specialty? And, and people, people don't realize um, that with the globalization availability of products from around the world, that pretty much eliminated cuisine uh, on a regional basis. So if you were, and I'll explain that. So if, if you were a chef in the south of France, well, there's only there's only 19 or 20 cooking techniques, and it doesn't matter if you're in the south of France in China or uh, you know in New Mexico. Um, there's 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 X number of techniques for cooking food, and what created the cuisine, quote unquote was the products that were indigenous to a specific region of the world. Mm -hmm. So like I said, if you were in the south of France, well, that French cuisine was based on those various products. Well, now we're, sh we're shipping products all over the world at any given time of the year. So if you're in the northern hemisphere and you want asparagus, well, um, and in the winter, well, they come they come from South America. And so that pretty much eliminated, you know, that concept of, of cuisine. So with that, the general public now has become, you know, one very health conscious and to, you know, know where you're, you know, farm to table kind of thing. And so with that, um, there is a, um, 
you know, back in the day, you know, your, your green beans came out of a can. They didn't come out of a garden. <laughs> right. And so, so, you know, now we're into this, you know, we're much more aware and um, that makes it so much more of a health benefit. Then you tie in the hunting aspect with all of its nutritional advantages. And that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a significant change from just, uh, okay, well, how big was your deer? What did he score? Or, <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? So now, um, it's funny, as we're sitting and re- recording this, one of my dear friends um, drew <laughs> a California desert bighorn sheep tag, not by the draw, but by the raffle. So oh, every, wow. every hunter in California that puts in for uh for this uh, for you know whenever you're putting in for your points whether it's deer or elk or whatever and so i don't know what the odds of uh of his there was one tag and when you applied you can apply for as many raffle tickets seven dollar raffle tickets as you wanted so i can only imagine the hundreds of thousands of tickets that were sold and anyway yesterday he was down in southern california and harvested his uh a California desert bighorn sheep, which is wow. one of the wow. one of the hardest tags to draw mm-hmm. out of out of any animal in the nation, and um, it was funny going. I'm watching him on social media, going back and forth. And his his wife is a great a great cook, um, and so she was she was all excited about uh, the the delicious little delectable she was going to get from this incredibly unique <laughs> situation. So it's a uh, yeah, we've come a long way um, to go back to your original question, but it's um, and it is. It's the I, I work with the with the, the California Department of Fish and Game out here and help promoting what they call their three R's, and it's basically they're trying to retain, recruit, and re-educate um, people that go out and harvest or forage or fish for their for their uh, food sources. And I, I put together a poster uh, at the Sacramento International Sportsman's Expo last year or the year before, and it was it was it was a cycle. So it's a journey. So the whole the beauty of going out and collecting your own um, protein sources uh, is you know it starts with education. It starts with you know being physically fit. Then you have to go and you have to outwit and 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 compete to harvest an animal in their own you know kitchen so to speak and and then you take it off that mountain you take care of it you properly age it you and then you go through and you figure out okay this muscle is good for this cooking technique this muscle for that etc and then you wind up at the end of the journey with this unbelievable prize, I guess you could say. And, um, that in and of itself is a, uh, is a very, very rewarding, uh, and not only delicious and healthy way to go about, um, supplying food for your friends and your family. And, um, there's a, there's a reason why the native Americans, uh, name for their leader is called chief. It's very close to chef, isn't it? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So when you when you were the guy bringing home the groceries, um, right. people people uh, looked that that was very high on the scale. Yeah, yeah. It's like one of those emotions that uh, it's not popular to talk about anymore. But the kind of feeling I have when I bring food home to my wife, you know, that feeling of like being a provider, a good husband, and like a man is just like it feels so good to me, you know. And now it's like no, I know it's we're, supposed to, like, uh, we're supposed to soften the edges of how I say that, but it's like no, 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 it, no, no, it no, nourishes no, something no. in me, you know. I really, I really feel it. Um, so tell me first. I, I've got a, a series of questions I want to just talk about um, cooking with wild game because you know you were talking about a time where um, specialty was a thing, and I imagine many people have asked you your specialty, and you say you know that you work with with wild fish and game, and I'm curious how chefs used to respond and how uh, chefs who are cooking more conventional ingredients, how they used to respond to that. How do they respond to that today? Has that changed at all over the course of the last, you know, since the nineties, I guess. Yeah. Well, as I said, the, the whole concept of your specialty quote unquote 
Um, I, if you if you consider yourself a chef, and I, I was in the restaurant industry for 22 years in New York, Florida, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Hong Kong, and opened 13 restaurants. Wow! And if you if if you understand the basic chemistry uh, of cooking and the basic techniques, like I said, 19, 20 different techniques. It really doesn't matter what ingredients are plugged in. There's, you know, what you you saute. This is the this is the fundamentals of that. Um, for tougher cuts, you braise. Uh, for for wild game, now that gets thrown into the equation from the you know the standard uh, domestic cooking techniques. And so people always you know ask me, okay, well you. You, you, you add bacon or you add fat or you add something to it because this meat is so lean and dry. And I, and my Ita- answer is Italian no. dressing. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, this, this is what you don't want to do. Um, because all you have to do, you, you have to adjust your cooking technique for those lean cuts of meat and, and, and get, and get rid of the, uh, get rid of the band-aids, get rid of the bacon, get rid of the, you know, the, yeah. the buttermilk and the teriyaki honey sake yeah. soy glaze and, the, <laughs> and all, all of the other, all the other band-aids that make your game animals not taste like anything other than what that band-aid might be. And, um, it, it's very interesting. So I've been, I've been, I started Wild Eats, Oh, 25, 26 years ago. And so I've done seminars at all the national conventions. I've written for a host of other magazines, including the Elk Foundation and the Mule Deer Foundation and Peterson's Hunting, Eastman's Hunting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And it has always been, I originally started Wild Eats because I, I felt myself getting so frustrated listening to my fellow sportsmen blame their culinary shortcomings on the animals yeah right. uh, it was always the deer's fault or the duck's fault or oh that antelope you can't eat and so i started going through the the steps of one harvesting and then what happens once that animal hits the ground and and how one out in the field needs to be able to do the best that they can to recreate almost like a slaughterhouse environment yeah man where there's hygiene and there's no cross contamination and there's a very cooling aspect as far as you know how you how you handle your meat and how that meat reacts to being mishandled i'll give you a perfect example i was uh uh this this past september i drew uh an antelope tag out in utah and um, it was it was one of two non-resident tags, oh, and congratulations. Uh, yeah, one while we were out there, we ran into a, a gentleman who happened to be in the military, and he was he was a resident of Utah, and he drew he drew the same unit, and um, so I I kind of was giving him some tips. Was, he, this was his first antelope hunt, and so in and as I was kind of going through why people would have a problem, I, I, I can't, I realized, okay, um, you're hunting antelope. It's usually a, in a, in a warmer climate, not always, but usually, and two, their habitat has like no trees. So cooling that meat down is very critical. You have to get it out of what we refer to as the danger zone. So that's uh, 45 degrees to 140 degrees. And when a piece of meat is in that temperature range, that's when bacteria grows the fastest. So one, you either have to cool it down and get it below 40 or um, cook it and get it above 145. Um, And then I realized, okay, so I, I actually was talking to a couple of guys at one of one of my sporting shows and they said, you know, John, we did, we did exactly what you told us to do. We got our animals, we got it cleaned out. We threw it on ice in a cooler. And I said, okay, well, there's the problem. Mm -hmm. So if you take a 120 pound piece of meat, that's a hundred degrees and you put it into a cooler, a cooler is not a cooler. A cooler is a thermos. 
Yeah, and it man. doesn't. Wow, it, it, well it, said. It well doesn't said. know. It doesn't know what it what it's supposed to do. So if you put a bunch of ice in this cooler, and then you top it off with a you know hundred and hundred plus pounds of warm uh, you know almost hot meat, and you close that lid, well, there's no place for that heat to go. So now you celebrate your your success in in the field, and uh, you know you go and help your buddy get his and. Three days later, you drive back to California and then you go in the back of the truck and you open up that cooler and it's like you just got hit with, you know, 20 pounds of, uh, of rubbish. Uh, well, that's because that meat was insulated and stayed in the danger zone for way too long and it, and it got ruined. Now, you're going to, you're you know, most guys go and they'll either get it processed or they'll process it themselves and then they... Uh, you know, a month later, they'll they'll go and, and they'll tell their wife, "Hey, um, on uh, Saturday we're gonna we're gonna have uh, the neighbors over and we're gonna have a, a wild game barbecue." Okay, so now your wife has absolutely no idea what to do with this meat. This meat is not identified as to what muscle group it is, how to cook it, whether it's should be you know uh, cooked in a crock pot for twelve hours or quick seared on a grill. And so now the meat, now the, the neighbors come over and you're having a good time. Your, uh, your wife is going, okay, I have no idea what, uh, what's going on with this stuff. And so she cooks it like she would cook a piece of beef or a piece of pork or a piece of chicken. And, um, now the neighbors being the good neighbors that they are, um, they know darn well that your wife is an outstanding cook and every meal that they've ever come over for is delicious. Well, now they now they sit down and they're eating the antelope that was in a cooler for three days and completely improperly handled and unknowingly cooked. And so everybody's like, Oh yeah, and, and you as the hunter, you're going, Hey, this you know, I'm I'm the I'm the proud, you know, successful guy here. And so it tastes great to you, but everybody else is going, okay. Um, and so what, 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 it, what is that that we're eating? Oh, that's antelope. Okay. So they say, oh, okay, great. Now in their mind, they're going, okay, note to self, antelope is horrible. And, and so now they base their opinion on, on that very thing that, because the, this train wreck from, you know, out in the, the flatlands of Wyoming or Utah has come back to your house and your, your poor wife is now put in a spot where there's absolutely no way that she could be successful. And anyway, I, I wound up after thinking about these scenarios going, you know, 90, 95% of all the people that are out in the field spending all kinds of time and all kinds of effort and all kinds of money trying to harvest these animals will never get to experience the full culinary potential of what they, of what they can be. Yeah. And, and that, 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 I, I mean, I was taken by that and going, you know, I have to do something about this. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so hence wild eats was born right. and um, yeah, it's uh it's, it's very, uh, very interesting. You know, I, I, I am, I'm going to go down in the history of, uh, uh, on my tombstone, they're going to say John McGannon, the uh, the dry age guy, and yeah. Uh, yeah. I, exactly. I have uh, I have figured out that the finest restaurants in the world dry age their beef for 28 days, mm -hmm. and those are animals that haven't even broken into a trot, no less climb up and down 10,000 foot mountains. Right, and um, so. The only way that you can properly break down these high intense muscle systems of wild game animals, whether it's a deer or an elk or a bison or a Canadian goose, um, is to one, remove the excess blood. So these, these wild game animals, as you know, everybody can look at a piece of, of uh, deer meat or, or a game animal and look at the color of it. It is incredibly dark and, you know, almost like an eggplant purple color. Um, and that is because it literally has two to three times the amount of capillary blood than does a regular domestic land animal. It is this blood that supplies oxygen to the heart and lungs 
of these animals while they're running up and down 10,000 foot mountains or um, escaping predators, or in the case of migratory waterfowl, you know, these ridiculous migrations that they do at, you know, 10,000 feet. So that excess blood keeps their heart and their lungs doing what they need to do in order to achieve what it is that they're trying to achieve. Um, and so most people, um, so that the wife who had the antelope, the next time she's asked to, uh, to cook that antelope, she's going to come up with the habanero teriyaki honey sake soy glaze <laughs> band-aid and try to figure out how to camouflage, pun intended, um, the flavors that she got from the first time. Well, the actual thing that you want to do is just the opposite. It's, it's a subtraction as opposed to an addition. So by adding, you know, the, the Italian dressing, you know, honey glaze, um, all you need to do is to extract the incredible amount of excess blood. And you do that through dry aging, which is what the domestic high-end restaurants do for their beef. Um, you, they don't have the high intense fiber structure of their muscle systems but it evaporates the excess amount of water inside of that muscle, which then concentrates the, uh, the flavors. And um, with the wild game, dry aging gives you a, one, a twofold benefit. One, you get rid of the capillary blood, which is responsible for all the gamey liver mud flavor. Now, the capillary blood in, our, in all of our bodies is basically the broken down byproduct of what we eat. So if you're a deer and you're eating a bunch of sage up on the hillside and then someone consumes that flesh with all that excess blood, it's going to taste like the side of the hill. And the same thing with waterfowl. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, hunting is as ancient as humanity itself. And through most of our history, it wasn't just a physical pursuit, but it was also a spiritual one. It was one of the ways human beings came to understand ourselves and how to reverently approach the animals that would come to sustain us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes even initiation. That's why my friend Monsel Denton created sacredhunting.com. Sacred Hunting brings new or experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. Last time I was in Texas for a hunt, Monsel came out to hold ceremony for me as a way of deepening the experience, creating more reverence for the land, and of course, as a way of honoring the animals we'd be harvesting. That's the piece that's so often missing in modern hunting, a piece that many hunters would like to restore. If this is what you're after or you want to learn more, check out sacredhunting.com. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe, like Axis deer hunts on Molokai in Hawaii and even a northern Siberia hunt with the Nenets people coming up in 2022. There's only a few spots available for each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and you can learn more about Monsel and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. Now, back to the show. If you go and you shoot a duck that's eating aquatic plant life out of the bottom of a muddy slough and you eat it in its incredibly fresh state, it's that's where you get the mud liver flavor. So really the only thing it's a very simple process and if if you you know you give it a little bit of thought it makes complete sense so just simply putting a you know hanging up a a deer quarter in a refrigerator for you know 14 days and allow that blood to drain out you're also evaporating the internal moisture out of that muscle and without those two liquid properties the fiber structure of these high intense athletic muscle systems basically breaks down and becomes tender 
Yeah, there's an so, enzymatic process going on there too, right? That's sort of breaking down those tissues a little bit and softening. There them is, up. there is a, there is a, a little bit, but the real factor is, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a chemistry thing as it is a gravity and evaporation right, thing, and right. and it's a, um, there, you know, the enzyme factor comes into play. Um, when people refer to wet aging, which mm-hmm. I'm not a fan of because you're capturing that moisture. And when you have that moisture, then you're going to be able to, you, you, you're, there's a potential for breeding bacteria mm-hmm. and there, the enzyme slash bacteria aspect is very closely related. So I'm, I'm way more of the, you know, dry it out, get rid of, get rid of that excess moisture that tenderizes drain out the capillary blood that's your gamey flavor and now now you're left with this piece of meat that if properly cooked and on my website at wildeats.com i have a uh, i have a section um called uh, tutorial pdfs and they're little posters that i've made um it's funny i got myself in trouble when i was uh, on the podcast with scott and uh we, we were referring to, I had gotten an email from an unnamed um, wild game chef organization. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll call it that. Okay. And it was, it was for promoting um, this, this document, this poster, um, uh, identifying all the muscles in the anatomy of a big game animal. And they wanted, uh, they wanted $30 for the poster. Well, I, um, I, I quickly mentioned to Scott that I said I have I I did I, I basically invented that about 25 years ago. It's called my Hunter Hunter's uh, Big Game Map, and um, you can have it for free at WildEats.com. So basically, <laughs> it identifies every muscle in the anatomy of of a big of big game animals. Um, I'll get I'll get back to that with one exception, and I'll, I'll tell you that story after this. But it it tells you where it's located what its name is, and what are the best cooking techniques for, for those muscle groups. So, for example, um, the leg of a, of a big game animal is basically has seven muscles. Three of them are, are suitable for hot and fast cooking, you know, for sautéing, for grilling, broiling. Um, the other four are for slow and wet, you know, for braising, for making stews, for making chili. And... Um, Going back to that poor woman with the uh, with the antelope, uh, she had no idea what it was that she was she was cooking and or the proper way of uh, of addressing it. So, one identifying each one of those muscles, so that you then can go back and refer to to the guide, which tells you which cooking technique is is going that, to that's going to solve a lot of problems um, and and give you give you more answers than questions. Um, two years ago, uh, I've been pretty lucky in the draw and I drew a, Sounds uh, like a fr- it. <laughs> yeah, I, I drew a free range bison hunt in Utah and that was a, that was an amazing, um, it was in the book cliffs of Utah, which is right on the Colorado border. It is, uh, 1.2 million square acres. Wow. And there was about 600 free range bison running around on this unbelievable property. Um, anyway, I wound up, I wound up harvesting a nice, uh, a nice old bull and I can, I can normally, I could break down a deer in about 35, 40 minutes, uh, an elk in a little over an hour. It took me five and a half hours to, to break down this bison. It was about, we estimated at about 2000 pounds on the, on the hoof. And I don't know if uh, you or any of the listeners know, but bison, their hump is actually four different muscles. So when I said most of the wild game animals have the same right, muscle structure right, right. with the exception of bison. Mm-hmm. So that big hump that's on the top of their shoulders is four different muscles. Um, and it's, it, 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 it reminded me of, of like a lean brisket. Yeah. And, um, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to send you over the recipe for my bison pastrami. 
Please, I'm bison. sitting on a pile of bison right now, so that would be fantastic. Actually. There you go. Well, uh, yeah. So I, I did. I made bison pastrami out of the humps. Oh wow! And uh, so that was that was kind of a unique situation. Wow. It's the only animal in the world that that has that muscle configuration. I recently saw because you know you look at the bison skeleton and then you see how those uh, vertebral processes of the neck and shoulder stick up so high like a big fan to support those right. muscles. I recently right. saw some speculation. You know those dinosaurs you see that have that big fin on their back, and I saw mm-hmm. recently some speculation. Like, wait, what if that's like a bison and that wasn't like a big fin, but that was actually supporting <laughs> you know big neck muscles like a bison? There, there uh, but I'd go. like to jump in on something here. So one of the things that comes to mind too, you were talking about the different differences between, um, you know, wild game versus domestic animals, especially in the amount of movement, you know, or migration that they have. Another thing I just want to get your comments on, um, you know, if you go to a farm and you get a, a, a cow, you know, you're talking about a very young animal or a chicken, a very young animal, a turkey, very young, pigs, very mm-hmm. young. And then we go into the wild and we come back with animals that are five, six, seven or older, you know, years old. And, you know, recently I was just out squirrel hunting and, and, uh, there's a big crop of young squirrels this year. So I'm harvesting a lot of, you know, first year squirrels. And then every once in a while you get one that's, you know, got some big balls on it or something. And you're like, oh, this is an older one. And then you look at the amount of connective tissue in there compared to a younger one. And you see that as an animal ages, you know, they lay down more and more connective tissue. Um, so that's another component too. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts, because I think as game chefs, we're working with sometimes a a denser amount of connective tissue than we would if we had something, you know, from the farm. Oh, absolutely. And, um, that unto itself is another reason this is, we'll go back to the, to the dry aged beef and your, these are very underdeveloped muscles. Um, and by evaporating that moisture, you break out, you break down these high intense fiber structures. The other thing is also, like I said, with identifying each one of the different muscles and what is the appropriate cooking technique. So that, that's the difference between, you know, those, those young squirrels, you know, you, you throw them in a brine overnight and then you, you slap them on the, on the barbecue and boom, boom, they're ready to go. Well, the older ones, uh, maybe, maybe those, maybe those, those big back straps that are on there will be tender, but the but the legs are going to be a little bit tougher because uh, they've been jumping up and down trees for for an extended period of time. Years. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. I mean it's, uh, you the waterfowl uh, is the same thing, and or upland game birds. Um, you know people people who are used to eating domestic duck. Yeah, you take a you take a whole duck, you throw it in the oven. You know, uh, 65, 75 minutes later good to go and the mm-hmm. breast is perfect the legs are tender everything is good well um that's not so much the case that'd be like that'd be like putting a whole uh a whole deer on a on a spit and expecting the back straps to be perfectly medium rare and the shoulders to be <laughs> succulent and tender that i mean that that just doesn't work but Can't the it. unknowing person mm-hmm. um you know would, who, who cooks chicken on a, on a weekly basis thinks, okay, well, I'm just going to take, I'm going to take that honker and throw it in there. And I saw it on the, I saw it on TV that they put apples and, uh, and onions inside the, the cavity, which always kills me because that nothing ever happens with those. The, the heat doesn't even get in there, but, <laughs> get but you know, it, you have to understand the different dynamics of what these muscles are doing. And yeah, you can, you can take that, that duck breast and pan roast it nice and rare. And, and it, it'll be, it, it, if you have it properly dry aged, it'll be nice and tender, but you can't do the same thing for the legs. And the same holds true for wild turkey and pheasant yeah. and chucker. Um, they spend, these animals, upland birds spends more time uh, on the ground than they do in the air. And so their legs are highly, highly developed. Um, and uh, Those tendons in a turkey leg, they're like knife blades. Yo, well, that's but so you basically adjust your cooking technique. You go slow and wet, and um, every year I usually get you know two or three turkeys, and the breast, you know, I'll I'll dry age a turkey, and mm-hmm. basically on a dry age when you're doing it at home, all you need is a sheet pan with a little stainless steel rack, and another one of the issues or the challenges that uh, that I face when dealing with um, uh, hunters is 
they all want, everybody wants to take a shortcut. Nobody wants to pluck and clean and keep your, keep your whole birds intact. It's, it takes too much time apparently. And, um, and so not for the people the, listening to this show, just so you know, so you can, well, that's, any a, that's a good want. thing. That's <laughs> yeah. a, that's a good thing. No, it, tell them how to do it. Right. You get it. You get, you get what you put in. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah. You know, oh, well, you know, a guy will say, well, you know, I try to do that with the ducks and, and this is that like when I'm doing at shows and, and they'll say, oh, you know, it just didn't, it just didn't come out. You know, it didn't come out the way you said it was going to. So then I have to ask and go through the process and, oh yeah, no, I just breasted them out. And so if you are dry aging, one, you, the bigger the piece, the longer you can dry age. And with waterfowl you and or upland birds, you want the skin on, you want, you want that to dry out. You want the bones to dry out this way when you're draining out the, the moisture um, you're not losing 50% of all of your, uh, of all of your meat. So your yield is going to be much better. So in the case of like a wild turkey, um, you know, you, you put it on a rack, leave it in the fridge for maybe three, three, four days max. You don't have the, the capillary blood situation like you do on all your red meat animals, but just getting rid of some of that excess moisture helps break down those, those intense fibers and then I'll, then I'll bone out the breast, put those in a brine. I'll save the turkey legs uh, until I, I have a collection of them. Then chop up all the bones, turn that into a beautiful stock. Then once it's, once it's done, cool it down, freeze it. Then I'll either smoke or barbecue the breast hot and fast. And when you're dealing with these low fat muscle groups, whether it's a back strap or the breast of an animal, I have found that high heat for short periods of time and then resting and then repeated until it gets to, you know, 100, 125 for your red meat, maybe 150 for, for your fowl or water uh, for your upland bird, sorry. Um, and by doing these heat applications and then You're resting searing, resting bringing it back again resting Correct. multiple times R- oh no right. way i never thought to do that and well and so what happens there is with the absence of fat you know you could take a big old 2 inch t-bone and throw it on the grill and just leave it there until it's as done as you want because it has that excess fat that's going to make up for the loss of evaporated moisture, moisture. Mm-hmm. with the wild game you have these very lean muscle groups and you quick sear, you pull it off while it's resting. I, I refer to that as a passive cooking, yeah. which is not going to evaporate the internal moisture out of that muscle as much as it would if it was sitting over the top of an open flame, which will then retain excess moisture. So then it also, the carryover cooking process in that meat will slowly cook it into the center then you put it back on a couple, two, three times, depending on the size of your meat. And when you go in and get to the final stages, when you, you know, you, you use your thermometer or your fingers and you figure out that it's where it needs to be, then you're going to have a one eighth inch browned edge and the whole internal part of that meat will be an, an equal doneness. Mm. And it wow. will retain a much greater amount of, of its internal moisture because that's the only moisture that you have because of the absence of fat. Does that make yeah, sense? It does. Let, can I jump? I'm really interested in this capillary blood situation. I want to a- ask about that because, well, the first thing is, I you know, I took a bison this year out on Standing Rock and the rancher there really wanted me to take a head shot. And uh, beautiful, clean shot. Animal went straight down, but you know now the heart's not beating, and there's nowhere for it to bleed out from. So all that blood is retained in the carcass. You know, as opposed to let's say we take a double lung or a heart shot on a deer, that animal's losing a significant amount of blood. You know, you open it up, the thoracic cavity's just full of all that blood. Sure. Uh, we hunt bears a lot here. You know, over hounds and. You know, you'll take a headshot on a bear and again, same thing, retaining all that blood. Now, if we went to a slaughterhouse, they're going to pick an animal up by the, by the hawks and bleed it, mm-hmm. right? So it's going to, they're going to drain all that blood out of the carcass. And right. so this capillary blood issue is not really, 
present with the food we get from the supermarket, but then a lot of times well nor it, does it nor does it even have the excess capillary blood because like i said those the capillary blood is there to supply uh, yeah. the needed source for climbing up and down trees flying right. on migrations um these i mean so they, they have they, less rich capillary beds cuz they don't they, still need that level of oxygen they don't need it their heart their heart never gets right. uh, at at an elevated level where they need to subsidize the oxygen intake and so there, I mean, even just standing still, there's, there's a tremendous, uh, less amount of capillary blood Okay. and the capillary blood, like I said, is most people don't have the ideal condition for hanging, you know, whole animals or quarters. Um, but that is something that, you know, if you got an extra fridge in your refrigerator downstairs, you can do it, you know, uh, quarter by quarter. So basically, um, if we gut out a refrigerator uh, mm-hmm. and we can keep it at that ideal temperature, about what, 40, a little below 40 Well, below 40, degrees? you know, th- okay, th- so, 30, 34 to 40. Okay, so we've got that ideal temperature there. We can use that like a meat cooler and hang quarter by quarter, you're saying. You know, here you in Maine, sometimes in deer season, you know, not always, but sometimes we got those ideal temperatures and we can just leave our deer hanging. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and also, so let's say that I take a hotel pan and I put a rack in the bottom of it. Right. And uh, I put a piece of meat on that rack. And then I take another deep hotel pan, fill that with ice, and set the first one in it and put a lid on there. So there's no moisture contact. Right? Well, but you don't want to, you don't want to, by putting a lid on it, you're capturing, okay, so you capturing the, the, the evaporated moisture. So it'd be the same thing like if you go to the supermarket and you, you go down the meat aisle and they have that little section on the end price to sell because it's in the cellophane wrap and it's yeah turning a turning a funky color. Okay. Well, that's the same thing that you would get if so you, you put air the cover on it. Okay. You want it you want air circulation, you want it to get a nice glaze on the outside. Sure. And you know, I mean you could do this in your, you know, garage if if you monitor the temperature. You just you gonna want to make sure one, it's not froze you don't want it freezing defrosting freezing defrosting as long as it's a semi-consistent temperature you know below 40 uh above 32 um then then you'd be in good shape but you can you know if you had to quarter up a deer and you only had room for one leg at a time well then you you take the leg you put it in your hotel or sheet pan and stick it in your fridge and you know, I fortunately over the years I've had uh, access to uh, walk-in refrigerators, and uh, the bison that I got, which was a free-range you know, wild bison, and he was probably about eight years old. Um, yeah, I, I hung him for thirty-four days. Yeah, yeah, and, that's nice. And and the you know the uh, I'll send I'll send you some pictures. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've probably seen. You know, the it's basically got mold growing on the outside, and then when <laughs> yeah. and then when you cut that off, the looks beautiful, right? The smell and mm. the look of it is. I mean, it is as sweet yeah. of a piece of meat as you're ever going to come across. And yeah. that is my goal. That's my goal with Wild Eats is to let everybody experience that, and and to you know, there's a lot of time, hard work, energy, money. Um, involved in our endeavors to fill our freezers, yeah. And exactly. with a little bit more effort, you know, it's like going, it's like going the whole the whole way to paint a room. You you put the tape up, and you know, you got every detail taken care of, and then you just stand back and fling the paint on the wall. <laughs> right, right. You know, so it's a it's it's about the it's about the details, and uh, my uh, my my little tagline for Wild Eats is the relentless pursuit to achieve the extraordinary. And, um, it is, it's very rewarding sharing, you know, your wild game harvest when it's, when it is, you know, it's taken right. care of <laughs> through the journey. Yeah. And, um, uh, last week I had a friend of mine over at, the, at my house and, and they were, they were not, they were not hunters and I, I served them, you know, probably six or eight different wild game dishes and they were, they were just blown away by, they were like, I, I cannot believe that this is this is wild stuff. And, yeah, it's funny how you can you can have a really great experience and a really bad experience off the same animal, depending on how <laughs> you cook yeah, it. But, well, yeah, the details you know, of understanding yeah. the whys, but, right? So I have this. Que- I have a, a question though. So I'm trying to understand the difference between 
you know, you've got capillary blood. So that's that kind of spongy space between, you know, veins and arteries, right? Where the sort of blood is circulating through the tissue itself. And it makes sense to me that that's holding a lot of blood. Um, but talk to me about differentiating that capillary blood from the actual juice, the, the intracellular juices that are often lost in the thawing process. Because over on that page on your website you were talking about, you've got a PDF talking about thawing as well. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that animals that have been headshot, like I was saying, they because they hold so much of that blood, um, you know, that thawing out, a lot of blood comes out. And I, and I, and that's not always just the juice because that meat will still be really moist when I cook it versus something that's been bled properly and very little juices are coming out during the thawing process. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that part's got me a little confused. Well, and, and, and I'm, you're, you're going, you, you've done your homework. That's good. You've seen the <laughs> steps, the, the links of success is what I call that. And, and, uh, this is a, this is another one of those areas, you know, that in today's hectic paced world, we have to have everything almost instantaneously, including defrosting our food. <laughs> right. So I'm sure there's a whole a bunch of people out there that are, they wake up in the morning, they're getting ready to go to work and they're like, okay, honey, what do you want to have for, for dinner? Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's pull out some of those, uh, some of those deer steaks. Or the bison steaks. Okay, great. So now they go on a plate. They sit on the counter. They're sitting there for eight, nine hours. And then you come you come back. And all of a sudden, like you said, there's there's this mystery liquid that's in on so that's sitting on the plate. The meat's all nice and defrosted, but there's you know, this uh, mystery liquid. And the basically that is the internal moisture that's supposed to be left inside of your meat. So as I, I, I put together on my little PDF poster, if you took a microscope and you looked at a piece of meat, um, you have all the little cellular structure of that muscle tissue and it's got moisture inside of it. Well, upon freezing, uh, we all know that, mo- that moisture expands. So now each one of those cells is like a balloon and it starts out with an exterior thickness of this, then it gets expanded and blown up. And so now the cell structure of that, each one of those molecular cells is stretched out. And so you go now from a 10 degree freezer to a 70, 75 degree countertop. And each one of those little cells defrost so quickly that it cannot hold its own weight because it's been stretched out. Right, so it used to be, uh, you know, it used to be a quarter inch, and and now it's one thirty second of an inch, and so subsequently now it's it's so fragile that that liquid defrosts so quickly and melts, it can't hold itself. Mm-hmm. So each one of those cells basically purges out, and that is the mystery liquid that's sitting on your plate. Now whether it's in combination with the excess amount of blood that's inside of that muscle because it hasn't been properly dry aged and or uh, the combination of just the internal moisture that you need in that very lean muscle. Now, the way that you fix that is you go from the 10 degree, 10 degree freezer to the 36 degree refrigerator and that slows that defrosting process down significantly, uh, you know, a big chunk of meat will probably take two, three days, depending on the size. But what happens is each one of those cells is slowly defrosting. Subsequently, the outer cell of that is able to re, you know, re, regain itself back into its own thickness and subsequently hold that internal moisture, which is that moisture that you need uh, because of the absence of fat. So I, I think that's what you were you were asking me. So it's the 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 why and the how. So well, what, so let's say let's say that because you've talked about in your in your interview you talked about putting meat into a colander and letting that blood drain out. So my question well, is like, how do I let that happen? Okay, great. How do I let that happen but not lose this moisture we're talking about? That's I guess kind of what I'm trying to differentiate. Okay. Well, once, once you, you the, now the colander works for the ground meat. And the reason for that is that, that the, the fiber structure of that muscle has already been broken down mechanically by being ground. 
Okay, okay. So you really don't have the issue of the, the toughness, but you still have the excess capillary blood. And because it's already been ground, simply putting it in a colander, and, and that you can actually cover because it's only going to be in there for one day. The, uh, the amount of capillary blood will just purge right out of that meat. That's that's um, before freezing or after you're talking about um, either or. Okay, got it. Okay, either sure. either or you that that, that particular applicant and and so and the same the same holds true for dry aging. You it just you know if you don't have the opportunity or the temperature is not right or you don't have the space, you can you can put things in the freezer and defrost it and then dry age it. That's uh, that, that doesn't matter that's when it happens. As long as it happens, the um, I often get asked about. Oh, you know how? What do I have to put in for into my burgers? They they always fall apart. And um, you know, I, I love watching people who say, "Oh no, you got to put you got to put pork fat into the into your <laughs> right. ground into Indeed. your ground yeah. game because that's going to help it." Well, pork fat is is a soluble ingredient, which is it liquefies so. How people somehow, I mean, it's like if you tell the lie over and over, you actually believe it yourself. <laughs> right. um, it, it, once again, this is not an addition situation. It's a subtraction. Uh, adding breadcrumbs, eggs, pork fat to ground meat is, is, is the Band-Aid. It's also the called problem. meatloaf, not burger. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And, and the, the problem is, and I tell people, all right, do this, just do this experiment. Go get yourself a couple, two, three pounds of, of hamburger meat from a beef, from a cow, and pour, oh, about three quarters of a cup of heavy cream into it. Then mix it up really good, and then make patties, and then throw it on the grill and see what happens. Well, obviously, that cream, upon being heated up, is going to vaporize and steam, and that's why the, your game burgers are, are are falling apart because they're being steamed by the excessive amount of capillary blood that's inside of that, oh, that meat. Oh yeah, okay. All right, so that's a, that's a liquid. So is the cream. They're, they're both they're, those are the same properties. Simply putting it in a colander, and the, the amount of capillary blood that will come out of you know just a couple three pounds of ground meat is is pretty amazing. Um, I, I, uh, I'll send you a picture. I did one of, one of the articles that I did for the Elk Foundation uh, was, was just uh, on this concept. And I think I had three double shot glasses full of capillary blood sitting next to like, a, like, a, like t- uh, you know, two pounds of, of ground elk. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and, and it is, it is that, it, it, I mean, it's, it, that's the liquid that is causing your meat to explode. So once again, it's a subtraction issue, not a, not yeah. an addition. Get rid of the band. You know, we don't need the band aids if we actually know know the whys. A lot of people know how. Not everybody knows why. To close out, man, I'm curious about some creative dry aging setups that you've either done yourself or you've seen people do. So, you know, I think for all for for me, I'm I'm at the point where I'm thinking, you know, I need to build a walk in here at my place because it would, I would get use enough use out of it. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I mean, people are doing everything from, like you said, throwing the meat right on ice in the cooler and just leaving the drain open to, you know, this thing we were talking about in the fridge with a wire rack. Like what, what are some things you've seen people do that you're like, Oh, innovative, that really works for proper dry aging. Well, um, first of all, if you did, I'm in the same boat as you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm considering putting a walk in down and downstairs in my house. Um, I've, I've recently lost my access. The whole catering industry has been pretty much decimated. So I, I used to have this beautiful 22 foot long walk-in refrigerator and I had a 15 by 12 foot walk-in re- freezer which I stored all my goodies but uh, oh, what a dream to have that yeah no it, it was it was it was quite nice um, but yeah just uh, get that get that refrigerator downstairs and um, you know you got your racks if you're on there you can as long as as long as your meat is not sitting in the blood that's draining out you're mm. you're gonna be in good shape. Um, okay. So an old know, refrigerator is the way to go for most people. Cause you can pick one up cheap, maybe even free, 
set yeah. it up down in your basement or something and you can either hang from the top of it or put things on racks in the shelves and let them drain like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, every year up at the Bohemian Grove, um, we'll circle back around to that. I do a, uh, uh, we do, we're, we're kind of famous, our camp for our duck dinner. So I will, I will, I have dry aged 80 mallards and I built this racking system in one of my reach-ins and I will, I'll, I'll, I'll rack 80 mallards, um, for about nine days um, the breasts get pulled off, the bones get chopped up and turned into demi-gloss. Um, I turn the legs into confit, I render down all the fat to make the confit and then use the fat to, to make the wild rice oh, later. Nice. So, uh, everything, everything is getting utilized. Um, and just two mallards in a hotel pan in your refrigerator for five to seven days will give you about three quarters of a cup of motor oil thick capillary blood wow and that meat will go from eggplant purple to the color of a piece of veal okay and you will not you won't need the uh you know that like i said the habanero teriyaki honey sake soy glaze a little a little ginger citrus rub from wild eats and uh quick quick sear in a pan and uh you will you will make yourself lots of friends I'm, I'm afraid on your tombstone, it might say the dry aging guy. And then parasthetically, it might say, uh, and the drain, the capillary blood guy. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're one in the same. They're uh, interrelated. They're, they're, yeah. <laughs> one is one, one is the result of the other. Yeah. Right on. Tell people about, uh, where they find, uh, your stuff, um, your website, the, the rubs and, and spices that you do stuff like that. Yeah. Well, we got, uh, we have wildeats.com um, on the website. I also have a wild eats, uh, Facebook page, Instagram, you know, I'm, I'm one of the grumpy old chefs. I'm, I'm, I'm a little slow at getting up on today's, uh, uh, ever-changing uh, IT world, but you've you've earned that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. No, it's uh, it's been fun and it's it's incredibly rewarding. Um, like I said, if I've been doing these shows for this year, it'll be my 26th year, and um, I I sit there and I give out samples of uh, of my chili depending upon what animal I have in the freezer, and. Um, you know, the guys will come, come walking down, you know, at the, at the big sporting conventions and they'll, I'll see a guy point going, Hey, 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 there's your guy over there. There's your guy over there. So we've, we've made, we've made lots of friends over the years and it's, uh, it, it gives you a very, a very good, wholesome feeling when they come back and they say, you know, I, you, in fact, I had a conversation with a guy who called me yesterday and he was, he, he just was going on and on about how I taught his father, you know, 18 years ago, how to take care of the ducks and he's going to buy all these seasonings and send it up to all of his friends for Christmas. And he couldn't believe how uh, he was just going on and on. And that's a, you know, it's a, it's a good thing giving back. Well, you know, I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty keyed into a lot of this stuff, but I've got a, lo a lot of little nuances out of um, talking to you and out of that article I read. It was like little fine points that I was missing and um, just had, didn't have experience with. So anyway, I really appreciate all of this as well and uh, what you've brought to it. Any uh, closing advice for uh, listeners or fledgling uh, outdoor TV people? Uh, outdoor TV. No, I don't want to give, I, I get myself in trouble when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> off, off air, maybe. Yeah, no, um, you know, for the, okay, for the off-air TV people uh, or the on-air TV people, um, as we had mentioned earlier, th there is only X number of cooking techniques. Um, you, you, nobody's inventing a new way. You know, the, the last thing that was invented was basically the, the sous vide technique. Yeah. Um, and which, which is, you know, that, that was, that was 20 years ago. Um, you know, keep it, keep it as simple as possible and, and do, do the homework to figure out the why. If you, if you know why, um, you will convey to many, many more people as to how, mm. and, um, you know, just having an, having an understanding of, of, of the biology of what it is that's sitting in your freezer. Um, and that, and, and I, I strongly encourage people to, uh, to go to wildeats.com and, and print out, print out that hunter's meat map and you will be able to identify what the names are and, and what the, 
the proper cooking technique so you don't like you don't wind up like our friend with the antelope. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.